The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to 2017. Um, we're back in with the webinar's first one of this year. Um, and tonight's webinar is about pits and pets. And we have this evening to explain more about this. We have Andrew Love, who is now working for Rosper as a fleet audit manager. He's also a driver trainer and a member of the ADI and JCGC committee. And we have uh, Lynn Barry, our chairman for ADI and JC, who also does driver training. And I think you still do a few learners as well, don't you, Lynn? Just a few. Yes, I do. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Yeah. And myself, Ed Good Marshall, evening, presented it. Um, so just to run through just very quickly and remind people about the um, the on-screen panel that's at your right hand side there there's on the top right hand side you'll have a little arrow that makes the screen go in and out um, on there you'll see that you'll be able to ask questions on that side and we'd welcome any questions this evening to the panel um, if you type your question in there as usual i'll bring the um, questions to the panel ask away and if we get too many questions, unfortunately, we have to sort of sift through them a little bit. And uh, we'll, any important questions, we'll try and get back to you after the webinars. Okay. okay. So um, that's the introduction. And you can see the team members that are here tonight. So on we go. So Lynn, first of all, if you could explain the goals, what we're aiming for in this session tonight. Yes, certainly. And can I just say, um, if he is listening there, welcome to Roy, who is a driving instructor in the Netherlands, and I know he's joining us tonight. I hope he understands what we're talking about. I think he's worried a little bit that he might not, but hopefully, Roy, you'll get something out of this if you're listening and you're there. So the goals for the session um, are just some background bits behind what pits and pets are, explain and understand what they are, and see if we can help you with some strategies of coping with them and um, to get rid of the pits and to encourage the pets. And just to remind you that the pits are these um, interfering thoughts that get in the way of performance. And of course, driving, which is what we are teaching, is all about performance. Um, if we can replace the interfering thoughts, with the enhancing thoughts that we can do things, we can be successful, it is possible, then certainly we can um, help our pupils just get so much more out of what they're doing. So those are the goals for the session. Okay, thanks Lynn. Thank you very much. And on with the, uh, I think you're carrying on with this one Lynn, on the background of uh, where did all this yeah. started out? Okay, so Pits and pets, because it's easier to call them that than keep going through the longer terms, um, are really part of cognitive behavioural coaching, which is really looking at the psychology behind what makes people do something. It's about their beliefs and their thoughts and how that can make what they do different. Um, I think... One of the things that um, is interesting, if any of the people out there have looked or read Timothy Galway's book, The Inner Game, that's really interesting because it's about these thoughts and beliefs. Um, the first book, because there's lots of editions, the first one really looked at the game of tennis as the inner game and about the fact that it's more about what he was watching the people do and what they believed they could do, and all the little voices in their head that kept perhaps saying they couldn't do something, or they found something difficult, or the perhapses, or the I can'ts. And when he looked at it and helped them believe in what they could do and think something through, their game got better and better. And I think, Ed, you said that you've read The Inner Game, but you've read the one about skiing, because yes. these are written yeah. for people with sport. Yeah. And that you find you've become a better skier since you've read that book. That's right. Um, mainly around dealing with my, my main thing was when I got on a black slope, I believe that which is a, one of the steepest gradients that you get in skiing. Um, 
and, and there's there's obviously steeper than the, the blacks that goes to double diamonds and etc but when you get on the real steep stuff the, there's this little thing niggling away in your head that you know you, you, you what if you fall uh what if you can't make it round these turns and everything and you you saw sort of, i found that i ended up with this argument going off between my head which was mm -hmm. telling me not to do it but yeah, I had this internal feeling that yes, I could do it. And I've learned through reading the book to trust my inner self and, and trust my gut feeling um, to, to for, through all my experience, because I've skied quite a lot. I'm a ski instructor as well. And uh, you've just got to trust your experience that you've done this thing before and, and you've done it many times, but there's always this thing in the back of your head going, yeah, but you're getting older. Yeah, <laughs> and, and sometimes your body doesn't quite want to do what your inner body what, what says it can do. So it, it can bring in some good ways because it can just hold you back a little bit from pushing too far. But some of the real sports people learn to disregard the head altogether, especially those that are going further in the field into danger areas, racing drivers and what have you, they have to trust on their instincts. And I think the one of the things is that sometimes your head can't think fast enough and you've got to just let your mind trust mm. what your body can do. And that's the thing that I think Tim was really trying to get across in some of the tennis playing that people were trying to think too much about how to hit the ball instead of just letting their right. inner self control the ball. Just do it. Let the hand go uh, and react sort of instinctively and that's what i really learned to do in the skiing as well trust what i know react instinctively and quite often through doing that you can save yourself from falling and all sorts but i think you know when you think about a tennis player they've got a ball coming at them at 120 miles an hour over a very short distance and you've got no time to think about it you have to trust yourself and just hit the ball so that's that's where i found it really useful there's one on golfing as well for any golf yep. out there Okay, so we can link all that really in a way to all those thoughts that people who we're helping and, and learning from us when they're perhaps taking their driving test. I mean, some of them might just get anxiety and fear before they even just come out to a lesson um, or a first time lesson. Maybe we need to talk to them even before they come out that first time. Uh, certainly, I know that I deal with people with these sorts of feelings and thoughts when they're coming into doing standards checks or they're coming into doing a part three or it's their last part three or their last standard check. And then all these sorts of thoughts start to come in and really interfere. And I'm sure, I mean, people listening, you've perhaps um, driven yourself home or you were going somewhere and suddenly you take a wrong turning or you get back home and you think, I don't remember much about that journey and you know really you probably should have done if you're driving and concentrating but those little thoughts going round in your head can be so distracting and they can put people off so much and those are the thoughts that really we've got to challenge and help get over and get over their fear and their anxiety so really that's what pits and pets are how we can get them from the anxiety and the fear into a happier place where they're going to effectively learn better yeah brilliant and Andrew uh, we're going to come over to you now to give us a little bit of a talk we're just going to break these down some some of this background information and talk about the cognitive um, process at the moment and I'll hand it over to you okay so uh, the cognitive uh, process it refers to the mental processes that take place when we're thinking and things that will affect that are our memories so for example if we've had uh, if we've not been very good at school um, certainly I wasn't and I was used to not doing well at exams uh, that could influence how you're th thinking about going into an exam it, it could be um, if your family have said um, oh you'll never be good at that um, or you'll never be able to achieve that. Um, it changes your thoughts and beliefs about uh, your past. Well, actually, it changes your thoughts, thoughts and beliefs about what you can achieve in the future. Um, if we can, uh, so if we can be, have more positive thoughts about it um, and think uh, about um, what we can achieve rather than what uh, has limited in the in previous uh, times, uh, we can be more effective in what we're doing. 
So that's about that slide. Good. We'll on to the next one, Ned. Yeah, we'll move on to the next one. There you go. And the behaviour side. Okay. So behaviour refers to everything we do. Um, the actions that we take, um, talking, writing, driving, um, and all of our inactions. So, in, including um, so actions. It might be as we're approaching a uh, traffic light. It's on green. It turns to amber. We know we should stop, but we don't. We just carry on. So, uh, um, those are the sort of um, uh, uh, behavioural issues. It's also behaviour is influenced by uh, our social group, what we're doing at the time, um, how we've been brought up, um, and all of these things uh, affect the choices that we make and how we um, really, um, uh, our beliefs. And one of the things we need to do is to uh, look at our beliefs and uh, uh, look how it affects our behaviour. I think there's a need to want to change a behaviour as well, isn't there, Andrew? Yeah, 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 very definitely. Um, some of the stuff that I've done, I've worked with, um, I've, I've worked with people who have been involved in crashes, uh, quite serious crashes, and they know they can't go on carrying, doing what they're doing. Um, but because of the, the past incident where they've had a crash, um, they uh, are struggling to see beyond that point. So there, it's getting them to uh, look at um, what they want to achieve and how can we change that thought process to change that behaviour. Yeah, lovely. Yeah. And back over to Lynn, just on the final one, which we've covered in a lot of our webinars, but just briefly about the coaching. Well, yes, because obviously what we're trying to do here is coach people so that we're helping we're encouraging, advising them, but we're giving them that sort of empowering feeling that they can actually do something. I think uh, we need to understand that people will learn to do something anyway, to be honest. Eventually, they will learn to do something. But it's how we help them to learn. It's not so much just about all that teaching and pushing things into them. It's allowing them to learn and just sitting there facilitating it, being part of it and asking those really important effective questions um, and the powerful questions sometimes, particularly with what we're talking about now, it's the challenging questions and the questions that will change where their mindset is into something a little bit more positive. Um, don't forget to go to the national standards and just read what it says there. As an explanation of coaching and what we should be doing um, because there are lots of words in there we've talked about in these webinars before like um, working together encouraging active listening supporting these are all the things we're doing but ultimately we're coming tonight from the how to get them from the slightly more negative place that they might be to the I can't do it so I can and I'm going to have a go and I'm feeling better about this. Excellent. Right, well done. Thank you. Andrew, have you anything you want to add to anything there? Um, not, not The only thing really that's important for everybody, anybody who's a trainer to recognise is that we've, as a species, we've got to this point. We haven't always had education to get us to this point. So we've learned in spite of um, our trainers and teachers at, uh, at some point. So, um, and often it's because we've um, thought about how we're going to do things or, and we've reflected on it, but we've not necessarily known uh, that that's what, we've, what we're doing. The good thing about the coaching and, and learning about coaching and, uh, is that actually you can start to help people with those reflective practices, uh, allowing them to work things out for themselves. Because if we allow them to work things out for themselves, they often get um, uh, they often get um, a better solution um, than, um, than than we would by telling them. And John Farlam, I always remember what John Farlam said to me. He said. 
um, Andrew, you always take my fantastic ideas, you take them away with you, and you make them better. He didn't quite use that word, he used a rude word, but uh, he said you make them better, and that's exactly what coaching is about, is getting people to develop their own skills. Yeah, it's developed strategies as well to be able to deal with yeah. those interfering thoughts, isn't it? And helping them along the way to, to yeah. do that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Next one. So this is about the interfering thoughts um, and, yeah. uh, and how yeah. debilitating they can be at times. And, and the, the yeah. people can get so many barriers, can't they, from, from these thoughts yeah. that they get. Yeah. Yeah. So if you'd just like I to... Call yeah, I call them the energy vamp energy vampires. Did you see when Ed was talking about going down, throwing himself down a hill, sorry, a mountain, a, a black mountain, and he said he had this little fella inside him saying, oh, you're going to get hurt. Well, I could see that energy vampire sitting on his shoulder <laughs> saying, you can't do that. Um, and that's part of a de the defense mechanism and we want to, we, what, what we want to try and do really is stop those energy vampires from inhibiting what you're going to achieve. Um, often it's because it's taking us out of our comfort zone and yeah. into a new area. Yeah. That's exactly what I and, feel like um, when I'm on the slopes. Yeah, you, you're going yeah. from that comfort of being on a red slope or a blue slope where you know you can handle yeah. it, and then suddenly you've got something yeah. that's less than 40 degrees. You're looking at 37 degrees in some cases yeah. of mountain. You're going to ski down, and instead of sort of looking out to the horizon, you're looking downwards, and, and that's that's yeah. where I get that. You can't do that. No, no. But you see, there's always a pub at the bottom of the slope, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah, there's always a pub yeah. at the bottom of the slope. Yeah. Uh, uh, and it's seeing what's down there and um, the negative thinking, the negative thoughts and emotions become really, really powerful. In fact, one of the, one of the uh, uh, little exercises that I use, I get people to, to think about, and perhaps we could do this now, uh, so the audience could do this now. Think about a really... Uh, a really sad event that's happened to you uh, and just think of, and re start to think about how your body's feeling think about what it's doing and uh, and how your body's feeling often you start feeling tense yeah and you start looking inward so you you're not actually you you becoming quite self uh, inward looking so you're not really thinking about what's going on you're not looking down that mountain and if you can start to recognize when you feel like that, um, then you can start to do something about it. Now, the next stage of that is to now think about something really happy, something that's uh, been, uh, been the most important thing in your life, the happiest occasion in your life. For me, it was when I married my wife, and I could, re and just how my body felt, and how. Um, as I was marrying her, not later on in the night, but as, um, as sorry, uh, as my, uh, what, what, how did your body feel then? It feels nice and relaxed and you feel really positive and really focused and that's what we want to, we want to move you away from those negative feelings and get you to visualize or think about those positive feelings. And um, if you can, um, at the safety at the side of the road, get people to think about that, those uh, uh, negative times and feel how, get them to feel how their body feels. If they can start recognizing that, then we can put a strategy in place. Often it's a breathing exercise or often it's visualizing that happy moment in, in time uh, uh, and then you can start moving away from those negative thoughts. Do you so that think covers all well Sorry, Andrew, do you think as well that other pe people can be or give you interfering thoughts? Oh, yeah, yeah. As much yeah, as they yeah, can bring yeah. you down and make you feel bad? Yeah, yeah, your parents are often the biggest uh, uh, the, the biggest offenders here. Um, 
because they don't want to see you upset when you fail. Oh, it doesn't matter. Uh, yeah, if you get a a a, a, a second, uh, if you don't get a first in in the degree, or if you get a B, or something like that, it doesn't matter. Um, don't be too disappointed. So they're using all those negative words. So you, they're already saying to you, uh, they're already there. Those energy vampires on that shoulder. They're already saying to you, you ain't going to be successful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they're already putting those barriers up in place. And uh, Lynn, you told us a story about um, somebody at the Olympics who was interviewed. They were yeah. Kind of yeah. It, yeah, it was at the last Olympics when somebody, I can't remember what the sport was, but she'd actually got herself the silver medal. But when the commentator was talking to her, he talked to her straight away as if he was disappointed for her and she would be disappointed because really she was going there for the gold and that's what she was expecting. Um, unfortunately, she'd obviously, because she was such a high-performance um, sports person, had been coached into thinking very positively, and straight away said she was absolutely over the moon. Here she, you know, she was the second best person in the world at this at this point in time. So, how somebody mm. could have been talking to someone of that sort of and um, you know somebody so good at what she was doing and yet bringing her down by saying she actually hadn't done well enough fortunately she managed to come out of it with very very positive thoughts she'd obviously been coached how to do that but I was just amazed somebody would actually do that to someone who just got a silver medal yeah yeah if we link that to driving instructors um, oh n n hardly anybody passes first time uh, particularly with part twos and part threes. Oh, if you get this examiner, okay, uh, they're awful. Um, so already the energy vampire, they're there with their big head and big mouth telling you that you that there are going to be reasons why you're going to uh, fail. Um, and and th that in itself affects how... Um, your client or your 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 learner um, uh, delivers their their strategy. So they've already mm -hmm. got a negative. They're going in. They're saying nobody's expecting me to to pass this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So their expect, expect expectation is quite low. I had a pupil um, last week who's mm. coming into doing his test, and I did say to him, "Is there anything?" that is concerning you, you know, that other people have said to you. And he said, oh, well, yes, there's one particular examiner at the, the test centre who does, and then went on to tell me what somebody had said. And, then, and he also said, and I understand, if I get to the bottom of the car park when I come out, I don't get it correct. The examiner will just get out of the car and stop the exam there. And I, you know, whoa, hang on. What's going on here? You know, yeah. we can go, what would you like me to do to help you here? Would you like to come in there yeah. and come out and see what it's like? Because there is nothing yeah. you can't do here. Um, otherwise, yeah. I wouldn't be bringing you, you know, yeah. but I'm here to help. Let's get you thinking a bit more positively here about what you can do. Um, because yeah. he all sorts of things going on in his mind. And while he's yeah. thinking that... He's not actually thinking about what's going to be at the end of that road and where he's meant to be looking and what he's going to do. And you can That's just see right. the sorts of things that happen in driving tests and why they happen sometimes. Mm, mm, mm. Preconceived ideas. Yeah, and it's it's it it, it can be uh, if you've got those negative thoughts going in, if people are introducing that, if that energy vampire is sucking all of the energy out of you, then um, you're going to be thinking, uh, you're going to be looking inward and you're not going to be seeing the bigger picture and mm -hmm. that is going to interfere uh, with what you uh, want to achieve. I love this energy vampire. I've got this little picture in my brain now of this little vampire sitting. I, I, I can see it on Ed's shoulder, can't you? Can you? Oh, I, no, I that's thought I'd got rid of it. Oh, thank you, Andrew. I thought I'd got rid of him. <laughs> Andrew, that another um, interfering thought can sometimes be that pupils want to be perfectionists. They can only 
think that they've got yeah. to get everything perfect. Yeah. <clears throat> It's really interesting. Uh, uh, some of you might have heard of Nigel Bottrell. He um, he has developed eight one million pound businesses. That's his um, strap line, and um, he thinks he, he aims strives to be a perfectionist. Um, what he realised uh, a few years ago was that. Um, he didn't need everybody in his office to be perfectionists. He just needed them to achieve a certain level, and um, so for, for for example, being okay at a at a task is successful. So it, it, when we're driving, um, lots of times we don't get it one hundred percent right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so for an example of that, you might just be over the speed limit. Okay, it's not 100% right, but you do something about it. Yeah, uh, it might be that you're approaching a uh, um, a traffic light and it turns to amber, and you go over that uh, traffic light. You've not quite got it right, but the roads in this country are very safe. I'm not encouraging people to do that, but mm. if we um, if we strive if we strive not to be perfectionists, so well, what, what, what did you do that for? Why, uh, why have you taken that action? Rather than thinking, well, okay, mm -hmm. that's happened. What can I do to make a change in the future? So there, rather than aiming for perfection and getting cross about it, because often you, if you say that you've not achieved that level, you will um, have negative thoughts. Think, okay, so what can I do differently next time? Uh, uh, that's um, self-evaluation, really, and uh, if we and part of teaching people to drive or preparing them for tests is what can we do differently in the future? What can what can we do to make a difference? It's also yeah. I mean, it's yeah, sorry, accept, I carry on. accepting that you're going to make mistakes, isn't it? Um, and uh, I think sometimes it's. Yeah, for the, especially for the people that are perfectionists, it's quite hard for them to accept that sometimes and helping them come up with strategies that they can then start to understand it. And I know we were talking about the uh, somebody doing a five-point turn when they maybe could have got round in three. And it's, it's well, mm. is there anything actually wrong with going round in five? And then getting them to start looking at things a little bit differently that sometimes things don't quite go right. And driving is one of those things where there isn't a Mr. Perfect. Um, and accepting that you are going to get it wrong, and not only you're going to get it wrong, but others are going to get it wrong when you're out there as well. So it's then having that acceptance that, well, I can get it wrong, and they can get it wrong. So people then hopefully can mix together better on the road. Yeah. One of the things um, in uh, full license holder training um, is what can we do to avoid crashes? So we don't look at the blame. So when we're running these courses, we don't look at blame. Whose fault was it? We look at what could we do to avoid a situation? Yeah, uh, because again, if you start looking for blame, that's looking for the negatives. It's removing the responsibility for yourself. If you start looking, well, what what can I do to, or what can I could I have done differently to avoid that? Uh, what could I do in the future? Then we're we're moving away from those negative barriers and and um, self-educating, so to speak. Mm. Yeah, and it, and that's quite a good quote that we've got on here. To realise your potential, you must minimise the interfering thoughts in your mind. Yeah, so mm -hmm. that's that's what we've been talking about there, yeah. isn't it? It's trying to move away from those thoughts. Yeah. If you see you think that, if people write those thoughts down. Sometimes it can help as well. Uh, any, uh, there's a number of ways of, of dealing with it, isn't it? Some people, if some people like writing it, they can do it yeah. that way. Uh, one of the visualization techniques that uh, somebody worked with me at was uh, um, um, uh, getting me to see uh, the negative thought as a picture. And then getting me to push it further and further away, make it really, really small, and then it was around a corner. Okay, so uh, uh, again, thinking about when I talked about those negative thoughts earlier, uh, 
pushing it around the corner and then it was in a piece of paper but then screw the piece of paper up and uh, then gradually that uh, really uh, that picture uh, of happiness that really happy time that was put in front of that uh, very small piece of paper and that happy time came uh, very close to us, so I had to visualize that coming close towards me. So that blocked out those negative thoughts. So that's, so that's essentially reframing, about, then, is it, Andrew? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, it, it, it really, it's about developing the strategies that suit the client or the learner or the individual that you're working with. And everybody is different. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's being able to find what they do. Yeah, um, and we've some of the things we've got there: lack of confidence, low self-esteem, poor communication skills, fear of failure, getting lost or missing the turn. If we look at somebody who's um, so, for example, me, when I left school, um, I was I'm I'm dyslexic, but it wasn't diagnosed until a few years ago when I went to uh, did my cert ed, um, and so. Everybody said, oh, you, you're stupid, yeah? Um, you'll never do anything with your life. Partly because I was dyslexic, so I couldn't, I, I found it very difficult to read uh, because of the way the words were, were uh, joining together and things like that. So when I came to do an exam, I had that energy vampire on my shoulder, yeah? That well, you're never, you're never going to do anything. You're never going to do it, yeah. And that was just sitting there. And that was the good old teachers that were telling me that, yeah. The ones that were supposed to support me through education. I'm not knocking teachers, Lou. <coughs> I'm not knocking teachers, because <laughs> um, effectively that's what I am. But um, uh, a lot of people, there is a, there's quite a number of people that aren't successful at exams the academia the more practical yeah. but we put the 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 system puts them through a theory test uh, where they have to read uh, and things like that and then they put them through a physical test uh, a practical test mm -hmm. and um, if they struggle with tests they will have this energy vampire yeah. just sitting there yeah yeah yeah. So, and what you said about everybody being individual and different, that's the key, isn't it? Because what will work for one person will not work for somebody else. I find that yeah. some pupils will really um, be helped by visualizing things and thinking about what's going to happen. Um, others actually can't do that well at all. But a lot of them do it really, really well. Um, and mm. some of them will come back and say something like, yeah, I've been thinking through Parallel Park, for example, um, and you say, oh, you've been out driving? No, I've just been sitting in the lounge thinking about it. And they can literally think their way through, yeah. through it and where they've got to look and what they've got to do, or they can visualize the road that we were in when we last did it. And it really does help some of them. And I think then it calms them down when they're actually performing yeah. it on the test as well. But there are yeah. others who will almost laugh at that and think that's not for me. Um, yeah. So it's not for everybody because we are all so different. But sometimes when you point out that the top sports people actually do use visualization techniques yeah. before they go to take a try or they go to take a goal or whatever and they have their own little techniques, some of them start to think about it a bit more positively. Yeah, yeah. But they're all so different. Yeah, I used yeah. to use um, visualization when I was um, doing slalom in skiing um, because mm -hmm. the, the slalom course, you had to learn it. And quite often, you spent a lot of time waiting for your go. Um, there was a picture there of the slalom course, and we used to sit there in front of it and memorize it and then get yourself going, and you actually skied it through your mind. And and it's amazing how how positive that was. And I've used that to, with some, some suitable pupils that want to – learn how to use visualization and they've done it for their maneuvers and do it at home sat on you know just get sat down in a chair and then think that they're doing it and, it, and it's amazing yeah. how it works 
Um, yeah. but it just just makes them focus, and it's it's what's on here, isn't it? it you become that which you focus on, and it, it's just yeah. focusing right down and getting getting that thought yeah. process going. So, and you yeah. you had quite a good um, when we're looking at the a, stalling, oh, game. The stalling, the game. stalling, yeah, stalling game. Um, when um, when I was teaching learners, um, uh, they'd often get cross because they stalled. So there was a couple of things that I uh, techniques I used to use. One of them said, "That's really brilliant. You've stalled really well there. We don't need to practice that anymore." Yeah. And another one is I used to get them to play a stalling game. So I used to take them to a quiet road, and effectively, what what you'd be doing is getting them to do a rolling first gear, um, and uh, uh, I'd say to them, "Right." What I want to do, we're going to practice stalling, okay? And you can tell me if it was a deliberate stall or an accidental stall, yeah? And um, then we go off and do it for five or six minutes. Um, and through that process, they 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 learned that actually stalling it was okay because it was part of the game. So the objective of the game was to stall. Yeah, and surprisingly, when I played that game, there was never an accidental stall. They could stall five or six times, and it was always deliberate. Um, it was always deliberate. Yeah, and so from there, um, it sets itself up because if they stalled at a at a, a junction or something like that, oh. Was that an accidental stall or was it a deliberate stall? Oh, it was a deliberate stall. It was definitely a deliberate stall, because if it was a de deliberate score, uh, uh, stall, one of the games, one of the outcomes with that is if it was a deliberate stall, I had to give them a piece of chocolate. If it was an accidental stall, they had to give me a big bar of chocolate. So um, I can't understand why. None of them were accidental stalls. I really can't. But you see, what happened there was that we both um, started to laugh and smile, and it just breaks the ice, doesn't it? And that's where the sort of thoughts you're having is beginning to change. Because I think when people start to learn to drive, one of the things they're most concerned about is stalling. And in fact, sometimes I think they almost don't want to stop at the traffic lights because then they've got to get the car started again. And they've got to move it and not stall. And all these interfering thoughts are coming into their head. So by making it something as simple as that, actually, that sounds a really good idea. Mm, it, it worked really well. It worked really well. And, of course, um, you, also the information you, there is you're talking through, well, what do you need to do to stall the car? What do you think you need to do? Um, so it actually breaks it down into really uh, small uh, uh, parts, so it examines exactly what's happening, and it gives you an opportunity to talk about that uh, mm -hmm. and um, uh, get, get them to understand um, why it's happening, the feelings around it. Um, sometimes it was uh, if, if uh, some people's suite was quite small and they couldn't reach the, the put the heel on the floor it was when their knees started to shake and stuff like that so you used to be able to build in strategies um, to help them with that really through a, a, a very uh, it was it's a great game yeah well you great. can see in their faces when they hit that light bulb moment that they can actually do something as well can't you yeah 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 mm -hmm. do you think with these um, because we're looking at the enhanced thoughts now what sort of things can we say and help them with I mean uh, sometimes I'll say things like you know how can I help you or um, this will get easier for you just reassuring really yeah um, I, I think anything like that it, it, it you think about the language that you're going to use yeah. uh, I, I think one of the issues as well is sometimes um, as driving instructors uh, you become their parents and you and you feel uh, mm. you feel for them when they uh, when they 
appear to be failing or they appear to stall or something or they stall like that and you want to sort of give them a, a big cuddle and say no oh, that's all right it doesn't matter um, and so there uh, we start introducing negative uh, uh, language um, rather than saying so oh it doesn't matter we stalled it's okay nobody's um, worried about it they don't know instead of okay so what's happened there uh, do you know? Do you know why you stalled? What um, wh What do you think? It, what do you think we could do to make a difference in the future? And often, I'll, I'll find, with that, it's just about. Sorry. Yeah, I find sorry, with that one through, um, especially if they're feeling pressure or rushed, is get them to think about where yeah. they move away safely from the edge of the road. A move away is a move away, yeah. isn't it? At the end of the day, it, it's it's changing, it's reframing the thought process into well, where can I move away safely? How do I do that when I'm at the edge of the road and yeah. I feel comfortable? And getting that yeah. positive thought that they can do it, they do it every time they move away from the edge of the road. I bet mm. they don't stall, but put them at a set of traffic mm. lights with a car behind that's blowing the horn, and then all of a sudden yeah. the pressure's there. They have to then recognise mm. the pressure's there. It's and then it's up to the coach then to start coming in with, well, think about how we move away when you're at the edge. Yeah. What would you do? Yeah. 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 And and start yeah. bringing in those thought process, make them think about the positive sides. Then they're, oh, my God, there's a car behind me. I need to get moving. It's taking those thoughts yeah. away. Yeah. And, and yeah. changing yeah. the way they're thinking. And just while you I'm... got any questions? Uh, yes, we I have. Yes. Yeah, no, I've got yet. one here. <laughs> um, um, so this Andrew... Um, to Andrew, being dyslexic, how can you give written feedback? Have you got any tips on how you might uh, do written feedback? I, I know why I'm dyslexic a bit as well, and what I do is I give them the pen and paper, and I get them to write their thoughts down. But that, that's that's what I would do. Okay, um, there's uh, two two ways I do this. Um, um, when when I um, when I'm working with a client. Uh, the feedback session at the end, uh, uh, sometimes, uh, because sometimes I do half day sessions, uh, what it'll be is I'll ask who, if they want to, to write anything down, or do they want me to do it? If I do it, I just do it in bullet points. Yeah. But if I'm writing a report or something like that, and this was really a tip that, um, uh, that uh, I picked up when I was doing my cert ed, I get somebody to proofread it and uh, recognizing that you can't do it all on your own you've got to have help Definitely. yeah um, uh, it's really important to recognize that and in my new role I've just had to start um, proofreading stuff myself and uh, a tip my wife gave me was read every word out and if you've got to put your finger in front of, in front of the word, yeah. then do it. It doesn't matter, yeah. you know. And don't be um, dyslexia. It doesn't matter. Um, oh, that's going back to that. Oh, it doesn't matter again. But dyslexia, there's lots of benefits of being dyslexic. Yeah, uh, processes um, often on that spectrum. You're very good at going through pre uh, uh, routines and following procedures. Yeah, so it can be of benefits. Often you're very practical and you can work stuff out. Um, or you, uh, I tend what I tend to do is I tend to be able to visualize uh, projects, uh, visualize the way of doing things. Yeah. yeah? Um, so you know. Um, all of these additional uh, uh, needs, um, they are there are benefits there as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I'm 100% with you there because I'm very practical um, and I use visualization a lot as well. I find visualization really easy, but that that uh, sort of moves away from it from giving written feedback. But I I, yeah. I, I think the one that we both picked up on there is that give them the pen and paper and if they're dyslexic, yeah. then maybe you have to work together. And and what's wrong yeah. with a voice recorder? Yeah, if, if, if it's yeah. that bad between the both of you, move on to a voice recorder. And a voice recorder, I've, yeah. I've had PDIs where we've actually recorded whole sessions. Um, and and yeah. it's really useful sometimes that people can then 
replay it back. I I even have the in-car yeah. camera facing inwards, and mm. and it, it videos it. Yeah, and then your pupil they come mm. with their own SD card, and they take mm. that away with them, and they've got that. So mm. it doesn't have to be in some cases. It doesn't have to be written feedback. I know I've just done my A one assessors um, mm -hmm. course at York College. I did it completed it last year. And mm -hmm. for that, I was really struggling with writing the reports. And I went mm -hmm. to my course tutor and I explained it all. And we, we talked about how we could maybe get around it. I tried different ways of writing. It still didn't work. And she said, I'll tell you what, come in. We'll record it all. I'll ask you the questions. You answer it. And I said, that's brilliant. Mm -hmm. And I could do that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I can't translate that to put it down on, on in paper. Mm -hmm. I can't put yeah. pen to paper and write another, it. Another Another thing that um, I found very useful is um, actually have some headphones on, and with Word now you can dictate. Yes. And I find yeah. that very useful. Yeah. Uh, obviously, um, that's moving away from the in-car stuff. But if you've ever got to do stuff, there's loads of there's loads of uh, ways around all of this. Um, you know, some of the uh, Richard Brans Branson, he's dyslexic. Alan Sugar um, is uh, dyslexic. You know, some of these guys. Uh, 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 have been very very successful and yeah. and it certainly isn't it certainly shouldn't be an issue it, it shouldn't hold anybody yeah. back um, the only problem is I can't spell dyslexia <laughs> <laughs> Have we, got any other note, questions? have we got any other questions? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, no, we haven't got any at the moment come in. Oh, okay. um, so, um, nope, there's nobody. Think, if anybody's got one, any questions, thing, type away fast. Go on, Lynn. Yeah, one thing to say is that ultimately with this, what we're always trying to do is to end up so that we can coach ourselves through situations. And really, that's what you're trying to get your pupils to do at the end of the day. To be able to coach themselves into being able to cope with something, whether it's something as simple as coming into the junction or turning a corner in a better way or doing something for themselves. It's about coaching yourself. And actually, as driving instructors, sometimes we need to be able to do that as well. But the cognitive yeah. behavioral coaching is a, the ultimate aim of it is to be able to turn this around so that you can cope yourself through difficulty. Yeah. yeah. Get rid of those energy vampires. See them and shoot them. Yes. Are we allowed to say that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Metaphorically, of course. Yeah. 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 I can't spell that either. Metaphorically. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think I'd struggle with that one as well, Andrew. Okay. Well, if there's there's no more questions come through, and obviously that's that's satisfied, Jenny. We've yeah. got thank you from Jenny from that. Um, so. What we'll do is move on to the next slide, and there is the date and time for the next one, which I believe is 28th of February. It was hiding behind my question box um, at 8 p.m. Uh, at the moment, we're just talking with one or two people that might be hosting this with us, um, so we might have a, a different co-host next time. If not, it will be back to the normal team, and we'll see how things go. But thank you for joining us tonight. Lovely seeing you all here attending, um, and. Good evening, everybody. Thanks, good everybody. Have a good night.